Should you get the updated 2023 COVID vaccination? Well, obviously, the answer should be yes. In mid September, the CDC recommended that everyone aged six months or older should receive the updated COVID vaccination in order to prevent serious outcomes this fall and winter. I really like this article from science.org. They state that scientists continue to debate the pluses and minuses of getting extra doses of vaccine. So on September 12th, a vaccine advisory group to the CDC once again will wrestle with the question of who in the United States should receive a booster shot to protect against COVID-19. Now, we obviously know the results of that advisory group saying that all patients over um, the age of six months old should receive it. But there was a pretty heated debate. Uh, this person, who is a biostatistician at Emory University, said there is room for reasonable debate about how much added value there is for a young, healthy patient. Two years ago, with the pandemic raging and vaccines dramatically cutting serious illness and death, there was little doubt about their value for everyone. Now, Dean says, we're in a very different situation than we were a few years ago. I wanted to take a little bit of a closer look into the evidence myself as someone who did receive the original two vaccines and the booster shot, but declined getting the bivalent vaccination last year as I was a little bit skeptical about the evidence. Here you can see the 2022 New England Journal of Medicine article, which they used to add support for the authorization of last year's bivalent booster. So this is a bivalent Omicron-containing booster vaccine against COVID-19. Now, last year when I was actually looking at this, I was a little bit skeptical about the strength of their evidence because if you look closely into the results, uh, the only thing that they were able to demonstrate in this uh, trial was that receiving the bivalent booster increased your levels of antibodies against COVID, but they did not prove any clinical outcomes such as decreased rates of severe disease or decreased hospitalizations or severe illness in general. So you can see here in this graphic uh, that before the booster, this was the level of antibodies here, 332. And then after the booster, uh, about a month after, they had 1,473 uh, tighter ratio of their antibodies. For the other variation of the bivalent booster, again, they saw that increase from 298 to 2,372. However, again, they did not prove any actual clinical benefit. And so for me, uh, knowing that there are known side effects to the COVID vaccine, so first of all, especially if you're a young person, you are almost certainly going to develop a pretty significant immune response to the vaccine. Uh, and basically all young patients will have a pretty ba bad fever for about a day or so, which is pretty typical. Uh, and then it quickly improves after that. And then there are some more rare side effects that, um, again, are rare, but they do happen. Uh, for example, myocarditis, and pericarditis, which have been reported events of COVID vaccination. So doing my own risk-benefit analysis at that time last year, I decided that given the poor quality of the evidence that really only showed a boost in antibody levels, and then the known risk of uh, side effects, plus knowing that I'd probably be out a day with a kind of febrile illness from the immune response, I decided not to get the bivalent booster last year. But let's see if things have changed this year. So here's a couple articles that I just pulled up, and uh, you can see their headline was that the new shots are designed to protect against XBB15 and should also protect against more recent virus strains, including EG5 and BA286. Uh, I don't know why the names of these continue to get more and more convoluted and crazy ever since. I mean, first we started with like Omicron and Delta, and now they're just becoming random letters and stuff. I guess they got kind of lazy. So here they state that there will be better protection against severe disease, hospitalization, and death from COVID-19 in the coming months now that newly updated mRNA COVID vaccines are available. So these are some very great claims, but do they have the evidence to back that up? The new shots are expected to keep more people from getting seriously ill with the virus through the winter when infections and hospitalizations tend to tick upwards. The vaccines target XBB15, a subvariant of Omicron uh, that dominated the United States and the world from November 2021 until earlier this year, and should also work against uh, descendants of the XBB strain, including EG5 and BA2.86. One of the things they address in this article is how safe is the updated COVID vaccine? 
And here they actually talk about that concern for myocarditis that I, I listed. And they actually found that um, the concern for myocarditis uh, when you actually get a COVID infection is 1.8 to 5.6 times higher than the risk of myocarditis from the booster itself or from the vaccine itself. So you're at higher risk of getting myocarditis just from getting the infection. So uh, if you actually do a risk benefit analysis of that, it's a lower risk to just get the vaccine. Also, if you take a look into the data of myocarditis, it almost exclusively occurs in patients who are like 12 to 17 and then up to like 21 or so. So in that like kind of teenager, very young adult. So if you're, uh, you know, over 25 or so, there really haven't been very many documented cases of uh, myocarditis in that population. This is another article from the AAMC and they ask, how do the new vaccines differ from the previous ones? So again, they mention protecting from the XBB1 five version of Omicron. Um, and then they also say that the process nowadays is similar to how the makeup of flu vaccines change every year, according to the prevalence of certain strains. And so they feel that in the future, we're probably going to move on to a thing like the flu shot, which changes every year. And we're going to just need an updated flu vaccine or an updated COVID vaccine every year. Uh, they said you can't get a flu vaccine once in your life and be protected from the flu forever because of changes to the virus and which strains circulate at different times. I think they're basically trying to make a point that we can't, you know, wait for a randomized control trial for every single flu vaccine um, to make sure that it's efficacious. We kind of just predict what it's going to be and then make a vaccine for that beforehand. Um, just like, you know, for the original COVID vaccines, when it just came out, there were randomized control trials that showed really strong evidence for decreasing severe infection, hospitalizations, things like that. But since then, we haven't really had good, good evidence. And it's probably not going to be something that is cost effective in the future for us to run randomized control trials like that. So we're just going to have to predict what we're going to need to do in the future and make vaccines to tailor against that. So how much protection can you expect from the booster? Uh, the worth of the boosters depends on how you slice the imperfect data. When COVID-19 vaccines closely match the strain in circulation, as happened during the initial trials and in the first few months after they went into use, the shots can powerfully reduce cases of mild illness and in some cases prevent transmission altogether. Some evidence suggests the vaccines can also lower the risk of long COVID, but all of these positive outcomes are bonuses. So again, they're kind of Harkening back to the original trials, which showed really good evidence for reducing cases and transmission of COVID. But since then, we've had very imperfect data and really shaky data at all. So the main goal of the vaccines is to prevent severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And the data shows the boosters clearly help for a time. And an analysis published in the May 26 Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report looked at people in seven states since the bivalent booster became av available in September 2022. It gauged vaccine effectiveness by comparing rates of COVID-19-linked hospitalization and critical illness and in patients who had received the booster versus those who had not. In patients who were not immunocompromised, the booster provided 62 and 69% protection against hospitalization and critical illness, respectively, for the first 59 days. But the immunity quickly waned to just under 50% for both between 60 and 119 days. And although protection against critical illness remained the same out to 179 days, it plummeted to 24% for hospitalization. The median age of the boosted group was 76 years old. So again, this data set really doesn't... Um, you know, closely correlate with a young, healthy person who might be considering, you know, is the booster really worth it for me? You know, a lot of these trials are conducted in older patients who are at higher risk for disease. And the, we really just don't have the data for younger people. Just taking a little bit of a closer look at the data that was supported by that uh, morbidity and mortality report, uh, which first of all, I have to say is really great because this was looking at the data from the bivalent vaccines, which remember I said in the New England Journal of Medicine article, they had no data on whether this uh, reduces hospitalizations or severe illness. Uh, they only showed that the antibodies were increased. This follow-up study actually looked at the clinical outcomes, and that's really like the biggest um, point that I was looking for at that time. So you can see here in table number two, COVID vaccine effectiveness uh, against laboratory-confirmed COVID-19 uh, hospitalizations and critical illness. So you can see they broke it up into several groups. So in patients who were uh, all patients above 18 years old, if they had the monovalent vaccines only, they had a 21% vaccine effectiveness. And this was based on some odds ratio that they calculated. If they received the bivalent vaccine seven to 59 days earlier, then the vaccine effectiveness was boosted up to 62%. 
Um, between 60 and 119 days, uh, the vaccine effectiveness started to slightly wane down a little bit to 47. And then by 120 to 179 days, it was back down to 24, which was pretty much the same as if you hadn't gotten the booster in the first place. Basically, this is kind of how the flu vaccines work. We get really good protection for about four months, and then you basically go back to normal after that. But it really covers you during that a uh, severe period in the fall and winter where the rates of transmission are the highest. They broke it down between groups uh, between 18 and 64, and then uh, patients above the age of 65. Um, and again, showed pretty similar results with the vaccine effectiveness, uh, you know, boosting it up for a couple months in the young patients. But, you know, within just three, four months in the young patients, uh, they basically went back to their baseline level of vaccine effectiveness. Now, the main outcome of interest is was the vaccine uh, effective in protecting against critical illness? And here, unfortunately, they didn't break it up by age. They only did all of the patients in their data set. So anybody above uh, the age of 18. And so in these patients, if they only received the monovalent vaccines, they had a 31% vaccine effectiveness. If they received the bivalent vaccine within the last two months, they had a 69% effectiveness against a severe critical illness. Within the last two to four months, they had a 46% vaccine effectiveness. And when within the last four to six months, they retained at 50% effectiveness against severe illness. So this data is show, showing that, you know, for general hospitalizations, mild illness, you have about two to three months of good protection, but then it really wanes after that. But for preventing severe illness, this is actually lasting for up to six months uh, and maybe even longer uh, after you get the updated booster vaccine. So again, this was kind of the missing data piece that I was looking for in that original New England Journal, uh, Journal of Medicine article. And this actually shows us that there are some good clinical outcomes. Again, it's a little bit unfortunate that uh, it's kind of a blanket, all patients greater than 18, and they didn't separate or make subgroups uh, to see if this was an effect only seen in patients greater than 65, for example, or if younger patients didn't really have this effect. So unfortunately, we're not going to have that data. So because of this particular set of data, the CDC is just doing a blanket recommendation for all patients uh, above the age of six months old to get a booster. However, you can see that there was some debate about this as well. So uh, there was this pediatrician at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia who has strongly opposed the broad recommendation for previous boosters and says it makes even less sense now. The goal of the vaccine is to prevent severe illness, he says, stressing that many people wrongly expect the shots to prevent mild disease or even transmission. You can't ask people to get a vaccine if you're trying to prevent serious illness and there's no clear evidence that you are at risk of serious illness. If the CDC is going to make that broad recommendation, show me why that is, he said. Take healthy 12 to 17 year olds who have already gotten three doses of vaccine or two doses and a natural infection. Are they getting hospitalized? And again, we unfortunately don't have that data and the data they provided here didn't really break it down for us like that. This other person, an epidemiologist uh, at Brown University, favored a recommendation that laser targets the populations that will benefit the most from boosters. When you equate 20-year-olds with 65-year-olds, that gives 65-year-olds a different idea of what's necessary, she says, explaining that the elderly may not realize that the shots are especially important for them. Lumping everyone into one category for boosters may wind up leaving the most vulnerable behind. On the other hand, there are many proponents of a broad recommendation because it just makes it a normalized thing, just like the flu vaccine. Everybody should get it every year, and uh, that's what we should be doing from now on. And uh, they discuss that a little bit here in this section as well. Finally, the last part I wanted to bring up, and probably the part that kind of tipped me over a little bit, is uh, this section right here. But if I get a booster, could that potentially protect others? Again, we don't have the data for that, but it is suggested, right? If you're at, if you're at lower risk for hospitalization, severe disease, you're, and you have higher antibodies, you probably are going to be a little bit less likely to spread it to other friends or family members. And they said you might want to time that booster so that you have that peak level of protection when you're going to see your elderly relatives. And we don't have any data for this, right? But I think that logically makes sense to me. And for me, who's very interested in protecting a grandparent who's staying with me now and also our new baby, uh, this is a pretty clear reason for me, you know, especially with this new data for why I'm going to get the COVID vaccine this year, uh, despite not getting it last year. So again, the original evidence for the bivalent vaccine last year was not super strong. And there are some known side effects, especially, you know, you're guaranteed to get sick if you're young pretty much for a day. And there's that risk of myocarditis. However, the updated data does seem to show a clinical benefit, although again, not super strong, but 
and doesn't really stratify between young people, young healthy patients versus older patients. But it is a useful data point. And also we know that the strains that are currently in circulation are just so much different than the prior strains. And add on top of that, that you may have some level of protection that you may be offering to others in your family or older relatives who are more a little bit uh, more vulnerable. So even if you're a young, healthy person and yeah, it's going to suck. I'm going to have a fever for a day. Or you're going to have a fever for a day or whatever, and you're going to feel miserable. Uh, you are providing that protection to your more vulnerable uh, relatives and friends and, and family. So that's my overall thought process on getting this year's COVID vaccination. And I think moving forward, it's probably just going to become like the flu vaccine where we continue to get it every year. Let me know down in the comments below if you have any thoughts yourself. And if you have any questions or suggestions, love to hear what your thoughts are. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.